Vakoyan, Vakoyan, there you go, I'll get it one of these days, Vakoyan, still sitting very patiently as the new chancellor of the University of Nairobi. By the way, it's a non-paying job. He has a full-time job, but he's passionate about this one. Tell me, what, how did you get into climate change? Because you're very passionate about that. I'm not just passionate about climate change, I'm passionate about impact. And if you just look at societal change and societal impact, what are the big ticket items? It's higher education, it is climate change. So I think there is certainly a continuum between the two. And what I said in the beginning of our conversation, uh, Jeff, I I'm very much, well, I'm from the Netherlands, right? A third of the country is below sea level. We basically, we're living climate adaptation uh, for centuries. Technology which has been developed, which has been shared with the world on a commercial basis, is basically our export model. So when I was working on climate change for now over two decades, I really also learned that there is no way, Jeff, for growth, prosperity, development or jobs if you don't take into account the climate constraints. So I'm very impactful uh, oriented, um, hence climate change is one of my core areas and higher education is another one. I've been working for many, many years as a professor at universities in, in the global north, so to say. And this is now um, a unique opportunity also for me personally to combine these two agendas because I mean, com combining these two together, we can even live more. Yeah. Earlier on, you were saying um, you, you, you're a practical person. Yes. And um, you've been in and out of campuses before. Yes. And I know walking into this one, you must have thought to yourself, am I biting more than I can chew? Yes and no. Yes, um, what you see when you come into these different campuses are very passionate faculty. What you see when you come into these campuses are very passionate students. But in the town halls, which I had in the last few days, 10 of them, mm. it was, there was a common thread resource constraints, infrastructure constraints, curric curriculum which needs to be updated, yeah. and these are all fair points. But what I have learned in McQuinney, I arrived there a few months ago and it was um, being welcomed by the local community and they told me, if you climb a mountain, you find good things on top of them. And they said, one of which what you will find on top is investing in education. So in all the conversations I had to date in the last few days, it is this common understanding about the need for a social contract, mm -hmm. a social contract between faculty and students, between faculty and management, between the university and government, between university and philanthropy. I think that sort of reset is now vital to basically change the table from the constraints of today to the opportunities of tomorrow. And you may say, Jeff, that's very cheap talk. Think about it. In 2050, one out of four people in the world will be African. So Africa is the growth region in the world, is the engine in the world. But we're now at a crossroad. Are we going to lowball uh, the African continent? Are we really going to take a lift off? And for that liftoff, investing in higher <coughs> education is absolutely uh, vital. So the yes and the no comes. I understand that the challenges are significant, but I also want to particularly focus on the opportunities which are ahead of us. You were talking about uh, the reaction of people telling you um, the, the constraints that they have. And the, some critics say, you know what, a lot of, the, not a lot, but some of the curricula in the university is outdated. Mm -hmm. You were talking about a million people mm -hmm. out of work. Mm -hmm. So, in the last few days, I particularly focused on engaging with students. Why students? Because they're the main stakeholders and shareholders of a university. And I was a very interesting student. He was from English literature. And he said, um, I just joined the university. I had these high expectations, my high dreams, but I'm facing now the reality. And he said, I'm writing now a novel about my disillusionment. So I said to him, let's step back a little bit. What is happening in the higher education system in this country and many other uh, countries is that the enrollment rates are going up and that's absolutely vital. You know, Jeff, the world average in higher education ratio is in the order of 40%. How much is in Kenya? 20%. Mm. So there is this need for more students enrolling into higher education, including at the University of Nairobi. 
But if his financial revenues are basically stagnant and the numbers of students are coming up, you can see there is inherent pressure in the system where students cannot find their faculty, where faculty is overwhelmed to basically to support these students. That's not a lack of will, that's simply a lack of structural sort of constraints. That's why I said from the beginning, my three um, sort of um, results indicators as chancellor are very simple, finance, finance, finance. How can we diversify finance streams from the global community, from the regional community, from the national community, from the local community to fit the bill of the university? Because it was very telling, many of these innovators who I spoke to in the last few days, he said, well, I have great ideas. I have great ideas and they work. But I need to bring them to market. What we are lacking are business platforms where we can have university business conversations in a structural way. Not everything costs money. We have a great vice chancellor, I have to say, uh, Stephen Kiama at the university. We have a great chair of council. So the leadership construct is there. But what I suggested to the two of them, let's now build the platforms for institutional reform, which are vital in the coming period. Not five years from now or three years from now, in the next few months. I think that's now vital for the lift off of the university. Because I said to that student of English literature, you're writing your essay, he called it. But I said, you haven't finished your last chapter yet because you're still here. Mm. So let's write that last chapter together that there will be a plot twist between your dissolution to a real sort of delivery of his dream and her dreams in the years to come. You're talking about the staff, Prof. Um, how have you been received by uh, Dr. Kiyama and, and, and his team? Well, you may, you sound surprised perhaps, but I mean, very, very well, very uh, supportive. I was nominated, as I said at the beginning, by, by, by the Senate. I went through the whole uh, competitive uh, process. We have bold leadership at the top of the university. They understand the constraints of today and they see the foresight of tomorrow. They understand that, let's say, what may have worked a few years ago may not work in a changing world in the next few years. So basically, they also were thinking, well, what if? What if we just work with a person who is from a different background, who have a different skill set, who has a different network to complement for what the strong leaders which already exist. So I think that's also a testimony for the global vision of the university. Again, the vision of the university is to become a global competitive university which will transform society. So it's not unusual or completely out of the box that you also then bring in a global person uh, such as myself. Am I the one who will transform everything overnight and tomorrow it will be radically differently? Obviously not, because the same saying from the same McQuenny, um <laughs> people who welcome me, they said, if you want to go to the top of a palm tree, you have to put in the hard work. There is no shortcut. So I'm really cognizant it takes hard work day by day, but it requires at least a bold vision of where we want to go. So I'm really sort of uh, grateful that the university leadership, including the vice chancellor and the chair and the deans of faculty and the faculty and the students have now said very explicitly, we will become the number one university on the continent. Well, if that is now clear and set, then basically all the systems now need to be designed uh, alongside that vision. So I think that's a very um, inspiring um, journey to, to walk, uh, and that requires to do this together. So I hope, Jeff, um, that you will be kind enough to uh, invite me back in six months and say, okay, Patrick, where are we now? What have you achieved? What have you achieved yep. with the team in the, in the universe? Six months. Six months from Consider now. Consider it done. Done. Look, the first time Kenyans uh, saw an image of you was about three weeks ago when the president introduced you to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Before that, a lot of people didn't know who you were. Do you feel the pressure? Um, do I feel the pressure? Yes and no again. This is not a side job. Whether I'm paid or not paid for this particular role is irrelevant. This is about impact. The conversation I had with the president was a really good one. And there are clear similarities between the president and myself. I'm not the president, but he is very, let's put it like this, very executive. He's very results oriented. 
and he is very bold. So in our conversation, he said, transform, lift. Not just the University of Nairobi, because he also understands as a former minister of higher education, that higher education and development go hand in hand. And I said in return, I said, Mr. President, I humbled to take this role, but I also need your uh, work in this. Because bringing partnerships to the university, bring the world to the university, and bring the University of Nairobi to the world, there's also a role for government to play to engage with the global community in sort of positioning um, the universities, plural, um, in Kenya, vis-a-vis -vis the other universities in the world. Because I said in the last few weeks, I said to you, uh, uh, Jeff, before, I have been approached by many, many partners, and I saw some of the comments from, from viewers, mm -hmm. uh, which partners, who, uh, who came uh, uh, for, uh, forward. Well, the university, obviously Dutch universities, because I'm, uh, I'm Dutch. And what I said to the leadership at the university, I said, well, let's take a step back. Who do we want to partner with? What is our proposition? We're not going to just randomly run after one university or another university. We need to have a very clear vision of what we want to achieve, what our own assets are, and who our strategic partners should be. So I think that is and will be a very deliberate um, effort in the coming period. And that's what I want to report back on in the next uh, six months. No pressure. No pressure. Education system in Kenya has been going through a major transformation. We went from 844 to CBC. Mm -hmm. We've got something called junior secondary. I mean, there's a whole, and it's, there's a whole turmoil going on right now. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get this? Can you see this getting us getting this right? We will get this right, but obviously not overnight. Because if it would have been that simple, it would have been done. So there are inherent challenges in the system. But what I also have noticed, there's quite some energy around this educational agenda. And the reason, and, and positive and negative vibes, obviously. But the reason why that is important that it is there is that there is a common understanding that this agenda is critically important from primary school to secondary school to higher education and even let's say the transition into the job market there is a lot of effort on that sector today and that's exactly right i come from a country jeff which went through a election recently mm. And I'm not sure whether you followed this, but in the Netherlands and in other parts in Western uh, Europe, there is now a strong swing to the right, and not just to the right, to the extreme right, including in the Netherlands itself, where a right-wing, extreme right-wing party became the largest political party in the country. And now you see in these Western societies that the understanding of the role and importance of education actually is dropping. Not here in Kenya. Here it is front and center. And I would think, as, a, as an academic, is actually a good thing. There are so much, let's say, opposing views on things. Because in this dialectic debate, brighter, sharper ideas come forward. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you miss the good old days of the University of Nairobi. And I'm, I mean that tongue-in-cheek, where every other month there was a riot. Mm -hmm. They would shut down the city, literally. Mm -hmm. Um, it hasn't happened in a while, which is a good thing. But some people were asking, um, any plans to move this campus outside the nation's capital? Well, so let me just go back to the riots. Was I there? No. Was I briefed about it? Yes. In fact, one of the first meetings I took uh, this week on Monday, on a Monday morning, was with the staff unions, mm. right? The three staff unions, we had a very good uh, conversation. And I said to them, okay, what are your big issues? And obviously, it's about staff morale, it's about infrastructure, it is about financial uh, compensations, all these sort of structural uh, measures. And I said to the, to the staff unions, I said, well, there is commitment from faculty. Why? Because they're working at a public university. Do they have the highest salary in the world? They don't. And these are all very bright people. They can go to any other job in the world oh, uh, tomorrow. So they're very committed. They have very strong commitment from management. And there's clearly very strong commitment from, from, let's say, from the student body. And I said to um, the staff unions, what will be smarter as opposed to the tit-for-tat strategy is, and to focus on the division of the cake, let's first work together how to enlarge the cake. 
again, have more financial resources to the table, work together on sort of strategies where particular financial partners can be brought to the table because that will become a much easier conversation, obviously, between staff unions and management when the cake is not like this, but it's double the size. So in that sense, I also um, heard um, strong support for this new uh, direction. I don't expect strikes tomorrow. What I expect from management, what I expect from uh, staff unions, what I expect from faculties is this unified sort of uh, focus for, to move forward. Whether the, the main campus will go uh, from Nairobi to somewhere else, also, Jeff, I'm very good on things which I don't know. I mean, I'm not aware of, let's say, the underlying dynamics about sort of yet about where campuses should be. Ask me in six months, but my gut feeling tells me what I've seen here in the last few days, the campuses are being built up, they're being designed, there is energy on campus. So, I mean, I don't foresee sort of a massive transition, but I mean, six months from now, I will give you a better a more informed uh, answer to that question. Okay, I look forward to that. Um, what's the population plus minus? UN. Student population. In this, in Kenya? No, uh, UN. Uh, UN, 41,000. 41, uh, 41, huh? 41,000 students. How are you going to tap into this endowment, the 260,000 alumni that yes. you talk about? How are you going to tap into that? So what you need, to, what I think what we need to do, what I said to the vice chancellor, what I said to the chair of council, I said what is very important is to do benchmarking we should not invent everything from scratch. There are universities out there who have systems in place, Harvard being one, but I mean, there are many others who have really, who has made this into a business model. So I said, the first thing what we need to do, we need to benchmark. We need to copy systems we work from other universities and, try and tailor it and replicate it here in, in, in our university. I'm going with the vice chancellor and uh, the chair in April to the United States to look at some of these Ivy League um, uh, universities precisely for that. Where can we partner? What do we bring to the table? How are your systems working? How can we replicate those systems? So I think not everything is super complicated. Building an alumnus system, Jeff, I think you would agree, would not be the most complicated thing to do because it has been done by top universities. Yeah. And I think it just requires a deliberate effort on the side of the university to get it into place. You know, it's funny you say that because th those who go for a postgraduate degree elsewhere, let's say Harvard or MIT or Stanford, they associate more with those universities than they do with, the, you know, their first degree, which is probably UON, mm -hmm. which is, you know, rather strange, rather than the other way around where they feel more patriotic being here. Well, that's exactly where we need to work uh, on to repair those, uh, let's say, the thing is this, as I said before, do you, which I even believe, and let's see, where, let's see whether you agree, uh, Jeff. I strongly believe that the University of Nairobi has an extremely strong brand globally. And why would I say that? Because only in the last two weeks I have been overwhelmed with responses from partners across the globe who want to partner with the University of Nairobi. On the flip side, my sense is there is not enough appreciation within the University of Nairobi yet how strong our brand is. And a strong brand has a commercial value. We just need to commercialize uh, that. And that comes across with flagship initiatives, but also cultural change. I mean, in many of the conversations in the last few days, it was about the culture. The culture needs to change. Well, we have great faculties, let's say, arts and social sciences. I mentioned the importance of critical thinking. We have global stars in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And I said to them, we have a social contract. You have that expertise. Use it across the university where you have cross-departmental collaboration. I think these types of uh, partnerships, it's not just university, global north, university, government, but it's also within the university where I think lots of gains can still be made. Yeah. You know, it's funny that um, you know, when, again, when people go overseas and they come back with T-shirts and hoodies and caps and masks exactly. saying Veritas or, yeah. you know, all those, yeah. you know, why can't you guys do that here? And that's exactly what we need to do. I mean, I think the slogan of the university is work together. That's exactly sort of the slogan which I uh, <laughs> strongly endorse. But that's exactly why. Yeah. When I went to Harvard many years ago, I mean, 54 now, ages ago, the first thing you do is to buy a Harvard shirt because yeah. you feel somebody at Harvard. Yeah. 
I didn't see anyone here on campus with a University of Nairobi t-shirt while it is the premier institution in the country. So the students here on campus should be very, very proud. Obviously, there's a cost element to it that needs to be subsidized one way or the other. But I mean, that's exactly brand recognition goes hand in hand with identity. The identity of what do we want to be as a University of Nairobi is a fundamental question. Mm. And part of that answer is we want to transform society. What I have seen in the last few days, I mean, all the services being provided, all the technology being designed, all the sort of business model being operationalized, these are societal needs. And the University of Nairobi has them on offer. What do we need to do, Jeff? Connect the dots. And I think that will everybody that will lift the whole country and that will lift also the, the financial base. And I'm sure it will also make will make all of us proud inside the university to be one of the family members of the University of Nairobi indeed. There are those prof who say that uh, some of the other campuses that have grown in the last 10, 20 years have overtaken you in, in many respects. And also there's been a bit of a, a, a flight uh, from from professors and, t and and staff going over mm -hmm. because it's not as competitive. They feel it's not as competitive. Are you going to make it competitive well, for them? Well, first of all, competition is good. Why? It keeps us sharp, right? That there are now more academic institutions than less is a good thing, right? I mean, it's not oh, there's just the University of Nairobi and there's nothing. I mean, this is not the world where let's say a blind eye man is leading the world in a, in a world of blind. No, we have now other good universities in the country as well. And I would look forward to meet with my fellow chancellors of these universities. Where can we collaborate? You do this great, we do this great. There must be synergies somewhere. At the same time, it also keeps us more focused. What are we good at? Mm. There are many things and many fields we're extremely strong in. And I mean, it's one thing to benchmark ourselves within the country. It's something else to benchmark ourselves within the continent. I think we also should benchmark ourselves globally. Why is it that the University of Nairobi is, let's say, number 1,000 in the world, and the University of Cape Town is around 200. Why is that? Because there is a structured, sustainable investment in that university, which goes decades back. So do I believe that that can be repaired in the next six weeks? Obviously not. But at the same time, we need to take a quantum leap, right? We can't go gradual. We need to go exponential, and that's all systems on. You spent a lot of your time overseas. You said you traveled to Kenya a lot of times, many times last year. Yeah, years. You're, 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 going, you're going to change that in the next uh, couple of years or so with the global climate adaptation moving here or having a, yeah, a piece so of it here. Yeah, precisely, because let's zoom out. My day job, Global Center on Adaptation. What is it? It is an international organization which supports, let's say, vulnerable nations, in particular African nation to become climate resilient. I mentioned that number of 9 billion US dollars being invested in Africa in the last two years. Not just commitments, clear investments on the ground. So last year, I had the <coughs> honor of um, welcoming not uh, only President Ruto, but also other heads of state. They came to our headquarters in Rotterdam. It's quite interesting. Our headquarters in Rotterdam, I hope you will visit it one day, mm. uh, Jeff, is a floating office. Mm. It's floating on the water. Every day the office goes up two meters and it goes down two meters. It's the largest floating office in the world. In essence, it is a climate solution because it's, even, it's not just climate neutral. We sell electricity to the grid. So President Ruto came uh, to the Netherlands uh, to meet with the king and the queen uh, upon a state uh, visit. And I had the honor also to welcome him. And President Ruto came to the floating office and he said, okay, Patrick, you are supporting um, African nations, including uh, Kenya. Good job, do more. Um, you having an office in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, but you're supporting in particular Africa. Should we not also have a global center on adaptation office in Kenya? And that's precisely why President Ruto and myself, last September during this Africa Climate Summit, I'm sure you covered this in your uh, show, yes. when President Ruto announced that we will um, build, design and build the largest nature-based office in the world um, here in Nairobi. We will have the groundbreaking 
uh, this March, so two months from now, uh, on the groundbreaking of the Global Centre on Adaptation Africa uh, office in close collaboration with the Kenya School of Government. It's all to say that some things, if you focus, can move fast. Moving offices, investing in people, investing in infrastructure, it requires this sort of, uh, let me put it, uh, uh, Jeff, determination to get uh, things done. But it also requires, let's also be not, uh, uh, let's be open. So since I was appointed in the last two uh, weeks, you asked me how did uh, the vice chancellor uh, respond and how did the faculty respond? And it was, let's say, grossly, it was very, 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 very positive. But I also received, of course, quite some messages from people here in Kenya, understandably, were quite uh, skeptical to put it in a diplomatic uh, way. I'm not from Nairobi. I'm not even from Kenya. I'm not African. So there is also this perception what is this uh, fellow going to bring to us which we could not bring ourselves? And that, quite frankly, Jeff, it's a fair point. And the way I want to take it is that given that the institution, this is global, that the scrutiny of me will be even more severe. Exactly. So that's I want to be judged. This morning, uh, this afternoon, I had um, sort of a mini town hall with the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And one of the, uh, the students said, Chancellor, sir, I'm not getting used to that, <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, sir, um, what will be your legacy after five years? Where will you be proud of? And then I just turned the table and I said to that student, I said, well, this is not my legacy, right? This is our legacy. I'm not doing this for myself, I have another job. This is about the, the young, let's say, generation in this country to, to lift off. I have been in academia for 30 years, teaching not just to rich kids from the global north, but to many, many people from the global, global south. Why? Because again, without that sort of, um, sort of investment in that, in human capital, in essence, there will not be sort of development which will be inclusive for all of us. And that's not just good for Africa, but it's also good for the global north. Why? What is the main issue in Europe in all the political agendas? President Ruto was the last few days in Italy mm. for the Italy-Africa Africa summit. summit. What was one of the central agenda items on the, on, on, on the table? Migration. Why do people migrate? Why do they look for better life somewhere else? Which is totally understandable. If we were to lift society here at home, I think the drivers of the transition will also, let's say, decrease. So what I said to politicians, um, as, uh, which I'm talking to quite a bit, in the global north, the best way to invest your euro, your dollar, your pound for addressing migration, invest in the source, make sure Africa develops so that the drivers for migration also will be much less uh, intense. So I think these agendas about climate, about conflict, about migration, about education are very interlinked. And that's why I was actually quite delighted to notice that within the university, this cross-disciplinary thinking was very central uh, between the different uh, faculties. So. Um, is this a task uh, which is uh, very, very uh, tough? Yes, it is. Yeah. But I remember very well, uh, Jeff, very recently we had a new country person in the Netherlands. Her name was Sifan Hassan. Hmm. She, she came from Ethiopia. She, she fled from Ethiopia and she was a marathon runner. And she joined the Olympics and she was the first person who won two gold medals on the 1500 and the five kilometers and a silver medal on the 10 kilometers. So the Dutch reporter, Dutch as he was, was very direct afterwards. He said to uh, Stephen Hassan, great, this is his historical. What did you think before you started this race? And Stephen Hassan, I would even think with this sort of East African mindset, which was very compelling, she said, this road was very hard. The road to where I got was very hard. Mm. But hard is not impossible. And that's precisely on this higher education journey, including from the University of Nairobi. This road 
will be very hard, but hard is not impossible. So with that sort of approach, it will basically calibrate our perspective of success in the short term and where we want to go in the longer term. So I think that is sort of the mindset, uh, which is very, for me at least, very refreshing. Um, and as I said, I'm, um, I'm very practical and results uh, oriented. And what I said to faculty, students, and senior management of the university, let's identify the big flagship initiatives, which we want to move out first uh, with in the coming period. Yeah. Just a little side note on Sirf, Sirfan Hassan. Mm -hmm. She wasn't able to beat Faith Kipyagon last year, you know Indeed. that? Each time. So Kenyans win always. <laughs> Mm. Just FYI. Precisely. Lots of uh, feedback. Uh, we're going to go to our magic wall here. Stand by there. I'll read it out to you. And a lot of people want to know quite a few things, asking questions and comments. So let's go to the magic wall. Here we go. Zest Sports says, Prof, shall you discontinue unnecessary degrees? Shall you too make, uh, uh, i.e. engineers, be actual performers, not just in reading, but practical? Most of them come out and are unable to change a tire. <laughs> I would say, first of all, good question. Hmm. Secondly, I would say, there is now this scrutiny underway within the university to see whether the curriculum, faculty by faculty, is fit for purpose. Hmm. Because as I said uh, 10 minutes ago, Let's say the, the key lenses for curriculum has changed over time because the labor market has changed over time. Critical thinking being one we just talked about it needs to be mainstreamed across the board. Yeah. So I think there is now this sort of review activity. It's an ongoing review activity because the job market is changing. So I think um, the viewer who put this forward, I think also means that you can't have a curriculum which was set 10 years ago, expect that that same curriculum will be fit for purpose no. five years from now or even today. So, I mean, I want to reconfirm uh, to this particular uh, viewer that there is a strong focus within the university to, first of all, scan the labor market in a very sort of comprehensive way, talk to business leaders to connect to the university and then address and, and adapt the, the curriculum to make it indeed even more fit for purpose than it is already today. Absolutely, because a lot of people study actuarial science but come out not knowing what actuarial really means. That's a story for another day. Richard Otieno says, quite an articulate and well thought out roadmap for UON and Kenya, <coughs> excuse me, as a whole. Kindly ask Professor how he's intending to extend the same to other higher learning institutions to give Kenya a wholesome higher learning revamp. I think you touched yeah, a bit on that. But I think it's a good question mm -hmm. because I th my answer to this uh, uh, viewer is this. Let us first prototype the journey at the University of Nairobi to go to the next level. Let us learn and walk and fail at times to move to the next level. Yeah. Let us see what works and what doesn't work. But at the same time, be open and inclusive. Have this sort of vice chancellor's conversation, which is taking place, obviously. But at the same time, let's also have a chancellor's conversation with all the um, universities here in, uh, in Kenya. In fact, Jeff, what I would like to offer here on, on, on the show, I would hope next time when I'm here, I will be able to meet all the chancellors of all the universities mm. and see where we can find synergies amongst ourselves, nice. what they can bring, what we can bring, and how can we walk together. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Tsitati George says, ask the Chancellor how he is going to guarantee that the Global South researchers are part of the climate discourse globally. How is he going to break the status quo of uh, decolonize the entire system and ensure the University of Nairobi researchers are part of yeah, it? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good uh, question. Yeah. Most of the social media comments which I received in the last two weeks was exactly on this uh, particular point. I mean, also in the last few days, uh, Jeff, I met many faculty members who are not only bright, but also have very deep expertise in certain fields, including in climate, uh, in climate science. But what they said, well, what we miss is not just one-to-one -one connections with universities across the, the globe. We need structured platforms. Mm. We need to be able, not just I as faculty member X from, uh, um, from let's say, Earth Science connect to uh, MIT, but what about my students? What about 
internships? What about exchange programs? And that's exactly where these sort of strategic partnerships come into place. And I said to, to senior management, what I indicated also to the deans of the faculties, that's what I think we need to be very clear about. Who is our ecosystem where we want to dock into, so to say? And that's exactly how you, I think how you were to address this particular point. It's a very good question, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah, cool. Festus, uh, Festus Ongaga says, Professor Patrick seems very determined and has authentically portrayed this in his explanations. Question, is the high level of corruption in the country hindering his processes? And if yes, how is he dealing with that? Mm, it's a good question. The big uh, C. Uh, precisely, Jeff. A, a, a few months ago, I was at BBC Hard Talk. Exactly the same question uh, came to the table by Stephen Sacker, Stephen Lee, Sacker. esteemed uh, yes. uh, colleague. <clears throat> My take on this is the following. Right? What am I responsible, in principle, is making sure that the University of Nairobi functions well and functions better. What I'm responsible is that the systems and the accountancy and the reports, that that is really be done at the highest possible standards. As I said before, and you agreed, I believe, uh, Jeff, we have a brilliant vice chancellor. We have brilliant deputy vice chancellors. We, the systems are in place. It's not about financial accountability in the organization, which is the challenge. It's the lack of resources, which is the challenge. So it's, it's a, a slightly different problem set as, as um, was just presented by your, by your viewer. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on the issues where I have an influence on, not just opine on broad issues where I don't have even have a, a realm of, um, uh, of action to be, to be driven. Absolutely. Afro guests is the same. Professor has a strong voice. I wonder what the difference yeah. is between his roles and those are the vice chancellor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Afro uh, guest, for uh, mentioning this. I said today, yesterday, the day before, I know very well what I'm not. I am not the vice chancellor. Because what is a vice chancellor? The vice chancellor, in essence, is the CEO of the university. It is his day job to run the university. All the issues which you just talked about, about curriculum mainstreaming, about becoming fit for purpose, building alumni networks, building sort of connection, transmission belt with the business community from uh, on innovation and what have you, that's the task of the vice chancellor. Then we also have a council, like the other universities have as well here in this country. The council is de facto the board, right? The vice chancellor reports to the council, and the council has an oversight function, provides strategic direction. So what then does the chancellor uh, do as the titular head? And I tried to say this sort of at the beginning, uh, and also now for Afroguest, the chancellor's role is, in my view, is this transmission belt by connecting sort of the assets of the university to, let's say, uh, the, the broader ecosystem to make sure that we dock in into global processes. So do I have a responsibility on a daily basis to make sure that curriculum X, Y, Z is fit for purpose? No, I'm not. But do I have an interest? Absolutely. Will I weigh in in a sort of a soft manner just to provide uh, advice? I told you in the beginning, uh, uh, Jeff, um, I was a very active uh, scholar. I'm very, I am a very active scholar. I pretend to become an activist uh, chancellor. So yes, I have views on those matters, which I've shared with the vice chancellor and with the, with the council. But they are, and particularly the vice chancellor, is responsible to run the organization. And we have a very bold, effective vice chancellor, which I'm very pleased with. Yeah. There was a time when we were growing up in this country where the president was the chancellor of all the universities. Yes. All. I'm aware of that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hope Adara says, the new chancellor's passion is extraterrestrial. Whoa, like Star Trek. Yeah, indeed. Ask the good professor how he'll manage the bitter truth that perceptions lag reality. What if the deeper reality of UON is graver than the popular perception it draws from her privileged history and heritage? Let me first look at the name of the viewer. So I, I want to interpret this as hope. Mm. You put it hope or there, right? But it's hope. So in the last few days, I mean, the conversations I had with faculty and with students were not naive. They were extremely direct. 
they were extremely bold. So uh, I, I don't expect that let's say in the last, that I have been presented in the last few days with a rosy view of where we are. I mean, the issues were put on the table in a very explicit and articulated way. It made the emergency of the situation and the urgency even clearer. It makes me even more determined, and that's exactly what I plan to do. By the way, Jeff, tomorrow morning I have my first big town hall meeting at the university with all students of, uh, of the University of Nairobi. Some of those uh, who watch hopefully also have additional questions uh, to raise and ideas to, to share tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Well, it's not going to be as hot as this, though. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Kidding. Okello well, Malimu says, I'm very interested in knowing Professor Verkoyan's thought on how cost of acquiring education can be made more affordable yeah. at UON without lowering the institution's prestige yeah. and competence of graduates. Secondly, what legacy does he intend to leave behind? Yeah. We spoke yeah. about that. But on that point of um, basically Afford cost, affordability, yeah. you know, Right. So um, I just mentioned the September summit, which the president uh, uh, Ruto hosted uh, on climate change. So I was here, obviously, because I work on climate change and I brought other global leaders, including Ban Ki-moon, the eighth secretary general of the United Nations, who is my chairman uh, at the organization. I brought them to Mukuru. Mm. And then when you walk through Mukuru, you see the reality on the ground. But you don't only see the reality on the ground. You feel the reality on the ground. And I was pulled aside into a quote unquote, uh, Jeff, classroom. And then you walk in and then you see the reality on the ground. There's hardly any books. There's not a lack of intent from the, from, from the teachers or even from, from the children. But I was thinking, how can we get these Mukuru children on a trajectory from where they are there into sort of the University of Nairobi where we are today? That obviously goes way beyond what, say, within the realm of action of the university alone that requires deep investment in the education sector as a whole, specifically on the question of fees. It is the same sort of um, negotiation um, um, theory. We have to expand the pie of financing for higher education. We cannot only think that the government will pay the bill. It's not going to happen because the, the government is also in a fiscally constrained reality, um, not just Kenya, but in all countries, I would think, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and beyond. So once we have, let's say, more financial streams coming into the university, I think there will be much more space for, for grants, for scholarships, or what have you. But we need to get on with it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <clears throat> Sir Nixon Dugira says, Professor Patrick, how prepared are the universities for the CBC pioneer schools who will be joining you in five years' time? Are lecturers being retooled with skills for training CBC by then? Yeah, so that issue came also up in the last uh, few days, right? One issue which was discussed very prominently by students is, uh, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm in a university, I'm doing uh, whatever, English literature, or I'm doing philosophy, I'm doing engineering, I'm doing medical science. I want to get a job. I need to get a job, right? I need to get a well-paid job. So there needs to be systems in place, which we just uh, discussed, the transition out of the university. But there's also a pathway coming into the university, which is inclusive. And I think the efforts on the way today within the university to be mindful that we want to be and will be this inclusive university requires more investments in the nexus between the University of Nairobi and let's say the higher, the high school level system, which already of course exists in, in, in the country. I think that sort of transmission belt yeah. needs to be strengthened indeed in the coming period as well. Absolutely. Sam Mjanja says, I don't know Professor Patrick at a personal level, but I can tell that this is the right man for the job. This makes me motivated to enroll at the UON. He seems to have a plan and a man on a mission. My best wishes, Prof, as you take UON to greater heights. But let me, full disclosure, uh, <coughs> you may think I have plotted this question, <laughs> right? I mean, that could be well. <laughs> so, no, but no, not, all jokes we're, aside. We're not that cynical. No, no, no. All jokes aside, uh, Jeff, what I want to say is this. <clears throat> Sam, thank you for your very uh, kind comment. But I want to be judged on my actions, mm. right? It's not to be on a show 
and have a good interaction uh, with you, uh, Jeff, which will judge whether I'm a good chancellor or not. I want to be judged six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, 24 months from now. I'm not sure whether you want to invite me every six months, <laughs> but it will be a good start at least yeah. six months uh, yeah. from now. So my, my take uh, to, to Sam is the university will take off. But the university takeoff will take time. And in that journey, we need all hands on deck, yeah. from faculty, from management to students. And if Je Sam indeed is planning to apply to the University of Nairobi and will be admitted, I will be delighted that uh, Sam will be part of this journey as well. All hands on deck, right? Hezron Bitok says, Professor Phil Cohen is very practical and pushing forward an agenda we ought to have engaged ourselves in long ago. I agree with that. If he does implement the same, we will really reap much. I can see a focused man in him. One final one here, Eugene Steff says, listening to Professor Patrick uh, on JKL is refreshing. He epitomizes a workforce and vision driven to make you, you and the best university on the continent. Bold vision, system design around that vision and a leadership construct will make it possible. Cheers, Prof. Great reactions, great responses and great uh, interaction as well. So Prof, six months from now, we're gonna invite you back. Six months from now, what are we gonna see? Yeah, but a uh, question for a question. If you were to have uh, teenage kids, would you send them to the University of Nairobi? If I could afford it, yes. no. Because? Because I don't want them to take eight years to do a four year degree, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, um, the courses, I think a lot of them are outdated. Mm -hmm. So I will ask you that same question six months from now. And if invited, six months later, I will ask you that same question. And my hope and expectation is, is that over time, you and many of the viewers will answer that question differently. That is the journey which we're on. I thank you for your freshness and boldness and, and really candid uh, conversation. That's exactly the spirit I hope for in this conversation. When did you start becoming the host of JK Live? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm in good hands. <laughs> well done. Prof, good to see you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Welcome to Nairobi, Uni University of Nairobi. And uh, good luck in uh, you and, and your team. Wonderful. And like you said, all hands on deck. Indeed. Professor Patrick Vilkhoen. Vilkhoen. There we go. Remember that name, folks. This man has a plan. He has a vision for this country and the University of Nairobi, and he wants to actualize it. It's not just talk. He's not just talking the talk. He wants to walk the walk. Are you ready to walk with him? It's up to you, folks. It is up to you. Thanks so much for being a part of Jeff Kinnengel Live. Remember, every Wednesday, it's those three letters on the keyboard that follow each other. J.K.L. Thanks so much for being a part of the show, folks. We'll see you back here in February, because this is the last day in January. And Prof, I'm just going to go across and um, do a little salesmanship. Absolutely. Good to see you. Go All it. the very best. As I was telling you earlier on, folks, Jeff can